I put this up only because you've heard the phrase, oranges to apples. You're not looking at the same thing. Well, these are all oranges. This is one big glass of orange juice here. All right, let's go ahead and set forth our appearances for the record. You know, we'll camp, uh, you know, we'll camp, uh, 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 we'll camp, other than the ones we've already admitted? No, just are you going to use it for demonstration purposes? Oh, just, the, just the Milwaukee meter. Okay. One last question. Um, are you guys going to be uh, using, um, doing videos again that were from Jazz? Because the outside transcriber is saying that she can't pick up the Jazz video from the TV. Are you guys going to use any clips from, from yeah, Jazz? clips. We're using clips for sure. Okay, so what we need to do with that is when you when you do that, we need you guys to turn this mic and put it right there. Well, she can't pick up the volume. She can't pick up the volume from the TV on a jazz ah, recording. So what I need is I need this mic standing right close to the TV. <laughs> is there any way we could clip it to a board up there? I can send her the video afterwards. How's that? Can you do that for me, please? And then yeah, we're, we're using a really short video. Are you? Yeah. It's, not, it's not a jazz video, though. Oh, it's not. It's okay. not? Exactly. Just our jazz. I guess when you Which go. Which one's with the jazz? All right, Yeah. Okay. 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 Please be seated and thank you. Uh, do the party stipulate to the presence of the jury? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Robbins? I'm sorry, yes, Sean. Okay. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Yes. And we're going to continue on. Mr. Parker, sir. Yes, Sean. I'm going to move this a little bit further back as opposed to getting closer. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. You okay, Ms. Yates? One business day. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Well, let me first say thank you. I'm, I'm humbled, I'm privileged to be here to be able to present my plaintiffs as well as the other plaintiffs' cases to you. I'm humbled and privileged that you've been patient enough to sit through this. And you know, we hope to do this in four weeks, and I mean, four weeks, a month. They're knocking on the door right now, so let me just say thank you. On behalf of everyone, I'm sure the defendants and their attorneys feel the same. Now, let me also say that, hopefully you remember this, the first two and a half days I spent, I questioned each one of you in my hopes of trying to get a jury that was completely fair to both sides. And you all committed to that, and I want to thank you again for that. But I also asked you what I would consider to be intrusive questions about your, your character, your, your core feelings, your beliefs. And I did so because we knew what the facts would, how the facts would play out in this case. We knew how some people would testify, we knew the evidence we would present to you. And so those core values were important to us. And so I want to share something with you. I asked each of you about your lives, things that were important to you, things that may have affected you, the pain that you may have suffered through that affected your day to day. I don't know if you remember. Yes. Right. So I'm going to share something personal because I believe it will help relate why Mr. Kemp has suggested 14 minutes to each of these plaintiffs. And I'm doing the same for Mr. Haley and Mr. Bell. But because there's no formula, because there's no exact way of doing it, I believe this story may be helpful. Okay? So 
And I say this because I remember this day as if it was yesterday. And it's a day that I may not think of every day, but I think about it often. And so when you've described to me during this part of your process of issues you've gone through, injuries you've suffered during your careers, it made the story become more relevant in my opinion. I even thought about the fame. And so at 33 years of age, my sister passed away. We still to this day don't know why. But for roughly 24 days, I sat in the hospital with my mom and my brother trying to figure out. She was 23 years of age. And we don't know what caused her to be there, but she was there. And when I think about that, because that's certainly, I can tell you right now, truthfully, that's the worst day of my life. I still remember. And I always remember. And then I think about my clients and all the plaintiffs here. They had no idea why they were in the hospital. They had no idea why they were passing out, why they were confused, why they were being told to call your next of kin. No understanding of why. And when you think about the horror that goes along with not knowing why you're going through that, there's a value to that. There's a value to determine, to the torment. There's a value to not knowing. There's a value to not knowing whether or not tomorrow, because of the scarring to their liver, they may be back in that hospital. And while I believe that Mr. Blaine Jones set the, the floor by saying he wouldn't go through this experience for $10 million, Mr. Blaine Jones wasn't told, call your next of kin. He wasn't told, get your affairs in order. To this day, and for every day following today, those plaintiffs won't know whether or not the scarring on their livers will change their lives again. But we do know now, and they're fortunate, unlike my family, they're fortunate enough to at least know what took them to that hospital. And you know, each of you know that hydrazine caused them to go to the hospital. And we all know where the hydrazine came from. And we also know why that quantity of hydrazine, why that amount of hydrazine increased and increased and increased. We know now. And there's a value to knowing and there's a value to not knowing how this will affect them the rest of their lives. Now, when I'm asking you questions during the jury process, the jury selection process, it took a lot for each of you to share. And in 30 some odd years of practicing, I try to give back to the juries who given us so much of their time. Because this is a, a tremendous responsibility you've agreed to, to take on. This is, in my opinion, the best civil justice system in the world, and we appreciate it. But I wanted to give you something more than just Blaine's reason behind 10 million. Because that's certainly a lot. But there are other considerations. And when you consider, and this is a part of the whole deliberation process, you will see in the verdict form where you put in the amounts, but you will see in the jury instructions these considerations for why it's important that you arrive at an appropriate number. And so I wanted to put that and share that out, share that with you. Now let's, let's go to the easy things that we can discuss now. Uh, Shane, let me see uh, slide two, please. These are things where there's no, no dispute. All of the plaintiffs, their hospital uh, time from admission to discharge, they ask the AST, ALT numbers, and their water consumption. There's no dispute here in this case. There's nothing for you to do in terms of that. Let me see slides uh, three, please. Now, this is Mr. Belsky. And I questioned, you can see me there, questioning Mr. Belsky about his uh, experience 
after consuming real water. And as you call, Mr. Belsky purchased real water from Whole Foods here in Las Vegas, from both the uh, Lake Mead store as well as the Charleston uh, store, and Charleston Port Apache store, and he also bought the five gallon jugs. And I'll let him tell you what happened in terms of his consumption of real water. You can play that for me, Shane. Would you recall about your conditions there? Were you told to have anything from the physicians about your condition? Yes. Uh, once we got to the point where the tests were done and the elevated equipment levels were determined, um, I was told that I was in liver failure and that I should get my affairs in order. So I'm sure we, I questioned Mr. Belsky on September 18th. You can see that at the bottom, trial day number nine. More than four days were spent in the jury selection process. So he was really early on. The point is, he was able to tell you for himself what he went through. Let's see the next slide. Okay. So Dr. Hudson, he was the hepatologist, gastroenterologist who gave the causation opinion. Again, there's no dispute that hydrazine caused his acute liver failure. No dispute has been offered by Milwaukee or Hannah. Real water has conceded the point. And now you know that the court has already decided that Hannah is also responsible for the plaintiff's damage. Let's go to the next slide. Now this is Mr. Haley. Mr. Haley testified on September 21st, happens to be my father's birthday, and he testified regarding his consumption of real water. He works at Whole Foods, he purchased all of his real water retail bottles from Whole Foods, and I, he went over the entire stay at the hospital, but I, what I found puzzling initially when I met with Mr. Haley was his original problem that surfaced, the symptomology that surfaced, surfaced uh, earlier, where he passed out in the shower, and I asked him about it. Go ahead and play it for me. What symptomology led you to go to the urgency center? Well, I, um, I was going to the urgency center. I was going to the urgency center. I was going to the urgency center. I was going to the I think it was really hard, Teddy. I think it was really hard to hear. You may want to just replay that. I, well, fortunately, the writing, the, the transcripts below. Uh, I'll ask the jury. Can you guys hear that, or do you want me to play over? We heard. We heard. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. All right. After Mr. Haley passed out in the shower, he went to the hospital. A little quick here. He was not admitted that day. <clears throat> Symptomology increased. He ended up going back to the hospital, the urgent care. They said his AST, ALTs were so high. In fact, the, the nurse said it was so high. She'd never seen scores that high, and he was immediately taken to the hospital. Spent six days in the hospital. Now, Mr. Haley, not unlike Mr. Belsky and all the other plaintiffs, were interviewed by Dr. Hudson. Dr. Hudson gave his opinion regarding uh, Mr. Haley and found that he, too, developed acute liver injury based upon his consumption of hydrazine, which is in the real world. So let me show you the next slide. 
this is a summary also of Dr. Hudson's testimony. And Dr. Hudson, again, he interviewed each of the plaintiffs, with the exception, of course, of Ms. Ryerson, because she's no longer with us, and found that based upon all of their medical records, there was no other cause of their acute liver. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe any of the defendants have offered you any medical testimony to the contrary. He found that all the medical, based upon all the medical records and all of the examinations performed by all of these plaintiffs, no other cause. Go to the next slide. He also found that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, after studying real waters, concentrate found in three samples. They only took three samples, but every one resulted in a finding of high disease. Same with the Eurospins test. They took seven samples of the bottled water as opposed to the concentrate, no different than, than this, and every bottle was found to have a level of hydrazine. Not one, not two, but every. Two of them had below the reporting amounts, but hydrazine was still found. Next slide. Finally, Dr. Hudson found that all of the medical care received by all of the patients were related to the acute liver failure and caused by real water. Again, nothing to be nothing disputed in terms of any of his findings. Now let's try to discuss the difference between real water, Mr. Uh, Odul's client, and then the meter uh, defendants. We know that hydrazine was created in the electrolysis process created by this unique approach by Mr. Marlow, who has agreed that he's not a chemist or any type of scientist, and he developed what he considered a new, unique, creative way of making water by utilizing some tubes that he, titanium tubes, that they're titanium, from some Russian people he met at a restaurant. I think he spent $100 or so, I can't remember what the amount was. And he decided that's how he was going to make this water. What we also know is that real water never tested this process to determine that there was a single toxin in the water. Not one. Not hydrazine. Nothing. So if you're going to come up with a new process, you should test. They didn't do it. So the hydrazine is in the water, and then the compounding of the hydrazine becomes a result of the defective meter. And that's what the meter defendants have been trying to defend against uh, up until yesterday. Yesterday, the court determined that Hannah was responsible for the plaintiff's damages, and so the loan defendant at this point has not been found responsible yet will be made, that decision will be made by you. You will decide whether or not Milwaukee, who is represented by Mr. Robbins, is also responsible for the plaintiff's damages. Now, I will say that Real Water conceded its responsibility on August 30th, about a week before I met you, before, a week before we started this jury selection process. And we know it wasn't until yesterday that the court determined that Hannah was responsible. What we also know through the process of elimination, Milwaukee, despite hearing all of the evidence we've heard, because there's not been a single expert produced by Milwaukee or Hannah that says that the warning was adequate, that the tip card was adequate, that the tip card and the owner's manual actually were tested. Was it five minutes, 48 hours, five days? Not one oxidation process was tested. And even if they wanted to choose one of those recommendations, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can all agree that their responses to emails, chats, differ depending on who asked the question. So let's first discuss 
in my opinion, how this, the facts have played out for real water. Because real water, of course, has conceded. But I want you to understand the chronology one more time. So what we do know is that when this case started, it was in May, I'm sorry, March of 2021. And we also know that prior to that, we had the investigation by the Southern Nevada Health District, investigation by the CDC, and by the FDA. We know those things happen. And we know that during this time, Rio Water didn't conduct any investigations, didn't do any testing or support. And so let's look at first, let's go to exhibit uh, 16, Shane. No, I said slide 16. I'm sorry. I may have said it. I apologize. Wow. Right, go to the next. There we go. Perfect. So these are the test results I spoke of a few moments ago. Now go to 17 just to show the Europe in this test. These are the seven tests from the Europeans. And I'm giving you this information because real water had this information as well. Go to slide 18. So these are, can you blow that up for me, Shane? And I know it's on this board here. These are the complaints that we were able to find uh, through discovery in this case from real water. Look at number two. This oily red substance in the bottle became pill 32 ounce bottle. Now go to number five, so we can look at five. Strong chemical smell in one liter bottle, TDS reading of 26. Number six, gas, oh, go back up, here we go. Gasoline-like substance in a one liter bottle. Number 12. Ga gallon bottle smell foul and tasted like chemicals. 13, family, pets, and 87-year-old visiting parents getting diarrhea from real water. Two pets, one kid herself and her two parents, burning, sour stomach, diarrhea, rawness, cramping, copious diarrhea. Fifteen, please. Two bottles with fishy smell and taste, burner, probably said burn, her throat for a day, stomach upset, gurgling, black, tarry stools. And then finally, eighteen, please. Sixteen, I'm sorry. Deathly ill after first bottle of real water. Severe intestinal cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hot, and headache. I put these up because when our expert, as well as Hannah's expert, got on the stand, they both said that in sufficient quantities, these are the characteristics of hydrazine. Fishy smell, chemical <coughs> smell, ammonia smell. Now, obviously, if the water if every bottle of real water smelled that way, there wouldn't be so many people buying it, right? I mean, it's common sense. You wouldn't drink a bottle that smelled that way every time. This is where the common sense part of, you'll see this in your jury instruction, leads to one conclusion. If every bottle smelled like that, we would have five million people in here, correct? The inconsistency in the quantity of hydrazine is based upon the inconsistency of the readings and the, of the measurements coming from the work meeting. There's no other way that it happens. And you heard the testimony, and I'm going to show it to you and let you listen to it again. But you heard the testimony of the Hannah and Milwaukee employees, vice, well, I should say vice president and president. You heard it. You heard about complaints they received about inconsistent measurements, confusion on readings. There is no other logical explanation 
than the inconsistency in the readings coming from those meters that led to these variables in the water product sold by real water to these patients and plaintiffs. There's just no other way of figuring it out. And when you look at this chart, it goes from 2013 <clears throat> all the way to March 21st, 2021. And Mr. Kim and I and Mr. Pepperman, we brought some of these people here before you so you could hear their testimony. People who have no dog in this fight, who simply want to tell the truth about their experience. <clears throat> Let me show you slide 24. This, these are important dates, in my opinion. And they're important because real water should have conceded before August 30th, 2023. March 13th, the FDA uh, are notified about the five young children who were sent to Salt Lake City with acute liver failure, all exposed to real water. March 16th, day one of the FDA, joint FDA, Southern Nevada Health District inspection or investigation. April 7th, the inspection of the real water facilities concludes. We filed a complaint, plaintiff's complaint was filed May 12, 2021, over two years ago. Real water files its answer, a little more than a month later. The Southern Nevada Health District concludes its investigation in fall of 2021. They get the hydrazine test back October 18, 2021. The first two. The third one comes two days later. Then we get the FDA issues the uh, MMWR report. Their own expert, March 24, 2023, Dr. David Goldsmith, issues an opinion indicating that hydrazine in the water discovered at Eurofins and considering the FDA testing, the smoking gun is what he calls it, the smoking gun. You get the Eurofins test March 28th, and then finally August 30th, 2023, real water concedes, trial begins September 6th, that's the first day of A responsible, accountable company doesn't need all of this before they concede. If they had actually investigated any of these from 2013 to 2021, it would be different. And if they had done some type of investigation between 2009 and 2017, none of these uh, plaintiffs would be here. Because Mr. Belsky, the first, was in 2018. Mr. Haley, 2019. <clears throat> we wouldn't be here. Now, I want you to hear Real Water's own expert. Could you play slide number 26, please? Do you have any information as you sit here um, today uh, that would tell us whether those retail bottles with the hydrazine that you just mentioned had hydrazine above the toxicity requirement? No, I mean, they. this is what they reported, and they should have had zero. The fact that they had uh, above the limit of detection, at least uh, five, four, if, if, if not four, at least four out of the five positive, um, says to me that, and I, you know, I, I don't want to use this term, but this is the, uh, the smoking gun that we, you know, concerned with the epidemiology and field investigations, um, and this matches up with what the um, the FDA uh, chemists found too in other samples of, of the concentrate that um, you know again, notwithstanding that there may be other uh, contaminants that are detected or found, but this does appear to me uh, to make it much more of a of a company-wide uh, kind of a concern. And it says also to me that the five-gallon 
uh, containers is appears not to be the only not to be the only source of the contamination. Thank you. After we award the own expert, the person they paid to investigate this case for them, told them that is the smoking gun. Why do you wait beyond May 18, 2023? There's no explanation for that. Now, what also came out, and you heard it, and Mr. Kemp mentioned it, the test that they could have done to determine if any negative toxic byproduct came from the electrolysis process could have been done anytime for less than $200. And they would have determined hydrazine is being created, let's stop using these titanium tubes. That's all it took. They chose not to. What they chose to do, ladies and gentlemen, what they chose to do, and every time I do this, look, I do this and remind me of somebody, I gotta stop doing it. But they chose not to do it because, in the words of their own employees, they were more concerned with getting product out the door and making money. That's what they were concerned with. And so, instead of investigating, instead of testing, what did they do? They gave free water. So, hey, I know that water made you sick. I know it gave your pets diarrhea. I know it sent you to the hospital. But what we're going to do for you is we're going to give you some more of it. That's what we're going to do. That's not what a responsible company does. <clears throat> That's the type of behavior that justifies exemplary damages. That's the type of behavior that deserves to be assessed with punitive or exemplary damage. You don't subject your customers to health problems knowing full well that you have numerous concerns, numerous issues with people in the hospital before our clients, and you do nothing other than send free water. And that's what Ms. Converse said. Patricia Converse indicated that when she took this to Blaine Jones, Blaine Jones says, don't investigate, give them free water. Now, one thing I did not like, and perhaps you picked up on it, Blaine Jones was brought to this stand by Real Water. Remember him? Vice President. Came here, and he was asked questions about drinking real water himself. Remember that? As if that's an excuse or justification for not awarding damages to these plaintiffs. So let's play this out with me for a second. You've all heard of people who may text while driving. You've heard of that. Hopefully you don't do it. But you know people that do. And you've heard of people who drink and drive, correct? Shouldn't do it. Now, I want you to compare this to what they tried to pull with Blaine Jones. Just because you put yourself at harm's risk, drinking and driving, or texting and driving, does that justify the passenger in your car? or the person you strike coming towards you because you bear into the wrong lane because you're on your phone texting or drinking. These plaintiffs didn't, didn't knowingly accept <coughs> that they were drinking hydrazine. They didn't know they were in a car with someone texting and driving or drinking and driving. They were drinking water, thinking they were drinking just water. They didn't know that the person who made it, who was drinking the same water, didn't test, didn't investigate. Just because you're dumb enough to drink water that you're not testing, it doesn't make it right to sell it to people who are expecting that you're selling water that doesn't include or contain rocket fuel. That was the worst example, I thought, of why real water should not be exposed to punitive damages. Because that's the only request that real water has at this point. They've said, we can see general damages or compensatory damages. You'll see it in the verdict form. It just says damages for each claim. And we agree with Mr. Kemp uh, for his reasons as well as the ones I just expressed why it should be $14 million per plaintiff, except for, of course, those, the parents and the rising years. But it cannot be based on the vice president of the company indicating that because I drank it, that means we didn't knowingly do something wrong. 
What he did was a conscious disregard for the safety of every person who purchased that water. That's what that is. That's an example of what that is. One other thing before I move on to Hannah Milwaukee. The witnesses that have come before you who have discussed the use of the meter, the employees of Real Water, they've all talked about the inconsistencies of that meter. They've all talked about issues in concerning uh, oxidation. We've seen it in, in emails. We've seen it in the deposition testimony that's played out in front of the court. <coughs> but what we've also heard from Hannah and Milwaukee's own expert is that the way that the real water people determine how much concentrate to put in these bottles was based on their meter. That's what it was based on. So if they wanted to add two and a half gallons more, like Casey did, Casey Aiken, the meter determined that. All right, so we'll move. I want to move on to Hannah and Milwaukee because I'm trying to uh, stay under a certain deadline that I've been asked to do by some others here. But the bottom line of real water, in my opinion, they have not disputed the fact that not a single bottle of water sold to a single plaintiff in this case or anyone else was ever tested for any toxins for hydrazine despite all of the complaints. Now real water is going to say we accept that, but it shouldn't lead to punitive damages because perhaps no other bottling company was doing it. That's not, that's not a defense. No other bottling company tried, you know, brought in a non-scientist who purchased a titanium tube from a Russian guy to come up with this new electrolysis process without testing if there were any negative byproducts. They're the only company, and there's been no evidence to suggest otherwise. So you have to treat them by way of damages based upon their conduct or what I would say, their misconduct. So let's take a look at slide number 27. Now this is the morbidity, mortality weekly report that we discussed. I showed this to you during the opening. And you see the spikes. Again, logic tells you that if real water's water was the same every time, and that or meter was consistent, this line would be this way, a lineal line all the way. It wouldn't have all of the spikes and valleys. You have those because it's directly related to the problems with the uh, or meter. Now, I want to show you the next slide, Shane. Thank you. This is when, and one of the questions came from the jury, I can't remember who asked this question. This is when the MA9025 was discontinued, June of 2017. Next slide. This is when Real Water got notice of it. Do you see a trend in terms of the high peaks? This one in 2020. Can you go back one slide? Here, here, here. If this meter was not the cause of the escalation in the hydrazine quantity, you would see, again, a flat line. And you notice, after they start using that con uh, conditioning kit, although it was toxic, the spikes start getting up high. There's no other logical conclusion that can be derived from this, this chart. And this is a compilation of information taken by this investigation from hospitals looking for drug-induced liver injury without a known etiology. That's what this is. And that's what the results were. So, in terms of Hannah Milwaukee, I was a little surprised by their opening statements, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember Mr. Rasmussen getting up and saying, or Mr. Robbins, but I think it was Mr. Rasmussen to start, maybe Mr. Robbins finished. And they started talking about uh, manufacturer, distributor, seller. We're not the manufacturer. Remember those conversations? Remember that opening? 
And I'm sitting back here wondering to myself, what difference does it make? Because you heard the law from the court, and you'll see it yourself in the written paper when you get a chance to read over it again, because you listen to 53 instructions. There's no way in the world you can remember all of them. But one of them says, there is no difference between a manufacturer, a distributor, and a seller. They're all treated equally. If they have something to do with this product, getting into the stream of commerce, they're all equally responsible. In this case, it's even better, because we've learned that Hannah owns all of them. They're the R&D, research and development. They're the manufacturer. They're the distributor. They bring it from Romania to the United States. And ultimately, they sell it from Milwaukee. They're, they're the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega, when it comes to that or me. Let's see slide 28. This is Mr. This is Mr. Rasmussen and his old. I represent Hannah Institute. You've heard a lot now of all the reasons that because we're related, that should say something. Okay. I told you I was a distributor. I'm still a distributor. Sorry about it. Okay. All right. You hear that? He's a distributor, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm still a distributor. Let me see exhibit uh, slide 29. Sorry about that, William. punish the distributor, even if I'm related to a Romanian company. Because then you're saying, since you're related to them over in Romania, that's why we're doing this. Is a Romanian company over here? How about the parent company? Are they over here? The distribution. You'll get the law on distributors. I said that two or three times. I want to make sure you got that. You'll figure that out. Good. Fortunately, the law figures it out for us. And as the judge has already told you, and you'll see it again in print, distributor, manufacturer, seller, they're equal responsible. There is no difference. Let me show the next slide. Dosing Pump is the company owned by Hannah that actually assembled the product after another Hannah agency caught all of the uh, materials. Hannah takes it from Romania to the United States, sells it to Milwaukee, Milwaukee sells it to Real Water. Next slide. I put this up only because you've heard the phrase, oranges to apples. You're not looking at the same thing. Well, these are all oranges. This is one big glass of orange juice here. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is the instruction. This is, you'll see this in the back. Product distributors and sellers are automatically liable for injuries caused by failure to warn or breach of the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose, regardless of whether the distributor or the seller is also the manufacturer of the product. That's the law in the state of Nevada. That's the law in this case. And when Mr. Rasmussen got up and said, I'm just a distributor. Don't blame me. That's the law. Next slide, please. These are the 47 countries within which Hannah has office. And so when Hannah gets up and talks about, oh, you know, we, we only have four employees in North Carolina or six in Romania and uh, uh, Rhode Island. That's him. Let there be no confusion about the size and the breadth of him. Next slide, Smith. Change. You remember we talked about interrogatories? And hopefully you remember when I had Mr. Salvaggio on the stand. And he was going back and forth on Hannah. Hannah, this is their admission. He signed this document indicating these things. This is the relationship of all of these companies. And you see here, dosing pump, the manufacturer. See at the top, 
one family owns the entire thing. So when he tries to distance himself from the manufacturer, there is no distance. When he tries to distance himself from the R&D, there is no distance. They're all a part of the same umbrella. They're all a part of the people that put this real water, I'm sorry, put this meter in real water's hands. All right. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. I'm going to show you something. I don't know if any of you, I mentioned this before, seen three card model. I don't know if you've ever been in New York. They got it all over the place, but for some reason I always see it in New York. Play this. I want this jury to see what the, how this goes. The shell covers the feet. Turn the volume up. The shells are then moved around like this, and then you've got to guess where the key is. Now, no matter where you guess, you'll probably be wrong, and you will lose your money. Whereas now, you're going to think it's going to be a little bit of a Maybe I can get a microphone pretty close to the. Stop for a second, Shane. Let me try it, I guess. The way it works is that. Where's that speaker at? Where's that over here? Thank you. I can break it up a little more over here. The way it works is this. The shell covers the pea. The shells are then moved around like this. And then you've got to guess where the pea is. Now, no matter where you guess, you'll probably be wrong. And you will lose your money. Okay? Where is it now? You're going to think it's over here. But it isn't. It's in the one that you least expect. Okay. Let's do this. If I take these two like this, move them over here. And see that immediately it disappears and it's over here like this. At this point, if you've lost loads of money, they will offer you a double or quits and they will up the ante. So they would move one shell out of the way, they would cover this one, ask you to put your finger on it like this, and immediately it'll be gone from here and it'll be over here. As I say, you cannot win. Look, watch, I'll put my hand here. I'll do it one-handed. You ready? Here we go. Three shells. The middle one's covered. These three get put up the top. If I drag them back, which shell is it under? Whichever you say, you will be wrong. It's not under here. It's not under here. Not under here. Where is it? Over here, under my hand. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the old shell game. Next slide. Now, Mr. Preet played that shell game. And you heard him testify. Well, it's not Milwaukee, it's not Hannah, maybe it's Dosing Pond. That's the game they wanted to play with this manufacturer, distributor, seller. Mr. Preet. Next slide. So, by the way, Mr. Preet was a controller of Hannah Company. Not just one, but more than one. Go right ahead. He confirmed the number of uh, locations in 47 countries. Keep going. He confirmed that Hannah shares employees. We know that Mr. Savaggio worked for, as the president of Milwaukee and the vice president of operations for Hannah. They share the same accounting firm. 121 local companies under that umbrella. Next slide. <coughs> Mr. Savaggio. Now, I put him in the same suit as Mr. Dupree, if you didn't notice. But he's also playing this game. And he confirmed, despite what Mr. Rasmussen said, that the manufacturer is under the HANA umbrella. So when Mr. Rasmussen and Mr. Robbins got out and tried to hide behind, we're not the manufacturer, we're not the manufacturer, it took a little bit on cross-examination, and you, you witnessed it. But eventually, we got this out of it. Next slide. Again, I want you to hear what Mr. Rasmussen had to say. This is a tire gauge. You see the analogy? An ORP meter, I'm a tire gauge. I measure with this PSI, pounds per square inch of what? 
air in a tire. Okay? I put this into the stem, what happens? Air goes out and it tells me pounds per square inch how much I have in my tire. Okay? Now I took this and threw it at you, that could be bad. Okay? Don't worry, it's about Now, I want you to consider Mr. Rasmussen's attempt to use a tire gauge as a proxy for the meter. Consider this, because I thought about it, and I, at first I couldn't believe he even suggested as much. But I want you to think of the idiocy of the position that Hannah took on this point. Let's say that Hannah made, instead of meters, made tire gauges, okay? We've all had a tire gauge. For those of us who had a car with less than the amount of enough air in the tire, we used a tire gauge, okay? Now, let's say that that tire gauge that Hannah makes always reads tires 10 to 15 pounds per square inch lighter than it really is. So let's say the tire manufacturer says, your tire should, should be 40 pounds per square inch, 40 on the tire gauge, right? But Hannah's tire gauge says actually 25 to 30 when it actually reaches 40, okay? So instead of you putting 40 in it, you're actually putting 50 or 55 because it's five, it's 10 to 15 pounds light. It's not accurate. Now, because that tire gauge has made you put 10 to 15 more pounds per square inch in your tire, you drive off and you suffer a fatal tire incident. It blows out. You die, someone else, someone else dies, someone's injured because that tire gauge gave you a low reading when it was actually higher than it should have been. That's what the meter did. The meter was giving wrong readings. This tire gauge, like this, this one may be saying 27, but the Hannah defective meter would be showing 15 or 10 because it's showing lighter than it really is. And it leads to a tire blowout. That's why that's such a bad example. But it's actually a favorable example for the plaintiff's position. Because if they're selling meters that are not accurate in terms of the readings, just like if they were selling tire gauges that not, were not accurate and led to injuries or deaths, they would be responsible. And that's the bottom line. That's why that tire gauge is such a poor example in terms of their defense, but proves our point for the plaintiffs. I want you to even consider this. What happens if 10% of those tire gauges are defective? It make you a little concerned about driving cars that use those tire gauges. 10%, let's think about 10% of tires on planes. You'd be a little concerned about getting on a plane. There is no way that is a defense to the meter defendant's position. He's trying to, with distraction, murking in the waters, trying to suggest something, ladies and gentlemen, that's not supported at all in the evidence in this case. What we do know from all the evidence is that those meters provided inconsistent readings. There's no oxidation process that's been tested and approved. There's no uniformity in the results of the meters. Everyone has said that. And we have enough proof to demonstrate how people have been affected. Next slide, Shane. Now this is Mr. Brown. Jason Brown, you remember his testimony. He is the number two guy in Apple Walk. And he has the, the title of being Mr. Selling Point. If you remember those comments that he made in, to justify his indirect lies using Mr. Savaggio's terminology. Play Mr. Brace, uh, Mr. Brown for us. In a typical year, how many MW500 do you sell to these six or eight companies that are involved with Cape and Water? Between 16 and 18 workers. 1600 to 1800 yes sir and would that be true back through say 2012 uh, I would say it's increased since 2012 
And with that number, that's a, but that's a number in general. That's not all specifically Kangen Water customers. That would include customers from all various markets. So the total number in general of MW500 sold annually would be between 1600 to 1800 Okay, and how, might, how many of those would go to the Kingdom Water market? I would say between 400 to 600. So approximately a fourth to a third of the MW500 are sold from Kingdom Water market. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So approximately a fourth to a third of these meters would be used to measure negative ore, correct? Yes, sir. So a third to a fourth of their products are being sold to people who need work. Given the confusion, the lack of testing, you would think that this company would have done something, some investigation, something to determine what's going on with their product, especially after they discontinued the oxidation chain. They chose not to. And on top of that, a 10% defect rate. Go right ahead to the next slide. Now this is the guy, again, he's saying in some of his emails, three to four days, some, the tip card says 48 hours. When it was the MA9025, it was five minutes. He's all over the place. Next slide, Shane. Keep going. These are his varying ways of oxidizing. Keep in mind, not a single one of these approaches were tested. Keep going. Next slide. Wait, Shane. Okay. So 10% of the probes don't operate the way they're intended to and you replace them. Is that correct? It is, but keep in mind that some of these are also end user error where they're not maintaining the probe properly. They're not keeping it wet, they're not cleaning it properly. They may not have validation solution to validate the plants properly. So some of it falls on them. But on the warranty card, you put defective pro, unquote, right? In this particular case, yes. Now, if you remember what Mr. Savaglio said, he said the industry standard in this industry would be two, three, maybe three and a half percent defect rate, and then he had to admit 10% is three times what he thought it should be, and yet no testing, no investigation. These are, this is the kind of you know, acts and omissions that scream that they be made an example. Every day that they let these questions go on and go on without addressing it meant that someone else, one of these plaintiffs, again, would be exposed to injury. And that's what happened. Next slide, Jane. Now this is Mr. Savage. I want you to listen to what he had to say about this. Right. Okay. What percentage of those probes would have to be defective for you to investigate whether or not the probe is adequate, whether or not the warnings are adequate, whether or not the instructions are adequate? How many, what percentage? One percent? Point? Zero five percent. What percentage of those would have to come to your attention as being defective before you would do some kind of testing or investigation on your on that meter? Uh, are you speaking of the meter, the yes. sensor, the electric? Just uh, the meter itself. The manual. The meter itself. Uh, I, I think a fair number um, could be somewhere in the in, usually at targets in the industry of about three three point five percent. Just so you don't have to take my word for it. And instead it was 10%. No testing, no investigation, no nothing. Next slide, Shane. Go ahead. All right. Did you have them test the probe after receiving any of the inquiries from the customers regarding inconsistent readings? I don't know if the readings were inconsistent, but I, I did not have anybody test it because it was not necessary to have them test it. I mean, that, think of the audacity of that. He didn't even think it was work testing. That's his position. If that doesn't scream and beg for some <coughs> form of uh, 
punitive or exemplary damages. I don't know what that is. Next slide, Shane. You all right, Alan? I'm fine. Going to 14. <coughs> Myth that you knew in 2020 or before that orb meters that you were selling after 2011 were being used by some purchasers in the process of making alkaline water, unquote. So yes. Sir. Okay, you knew that too, right? Yes, sir. Because you had tons of cake and water customers using your term, right? Yes. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to go over everything that Mr. Safagio and Mr. Jim, Mr. Brown said that were conflicting, because you heard it yourself. You heard a lot of it. But I want to hit some of the highlights. Uh, Shane, <coughs> go to slide 51, and then we'll go to the slide 52. Let's go to 51. And then from 2014 through 2017, we went to the MA25, right? Yep. And then the decision was made in 2017 to get rid of that and just go to vinegar, right? Right. So it seems to me we have five different conflicting messages here about oxidization. And let me go through them. We would revise the cleaning solution. That's exhibit 10 we looked at, right? Yep. And two, we said uh, that acidic water doesn't work. We should use the cleaning solution, right? That's yep. exhibit 10 still, right? Yes, sir. Then three, we said four to five days of vinegar. Call all those we saw? <coughs> right? I'm sorry, say that again? Three, we you you advised customers to soak it in vinegar for four to five days. We went through all those, right? Yes, sir. In four, you advise some customers three to four days in vinegar, so that's a fourth different thing, right? Yeah. In five, we've got the tip card or package insurance saying 48 hours vinegar, right? Yes. Okay. Would you agree with me that that is not totally consistent messaging to the customer? Yes, I would agree that it is inconsistent. But at the same time, it's not an incorrect answer. Okay. All right. So you would indict or blame customers if there was a little bit of customer confusion out there, right? Reword that for me. You wouldn't blame the customer for customer confusion, right? Uh, I wouldn't blame them directly, but I mean, there is end user error at times. So he admits the five different instructions. And something, this is something that uh, uh, goes back to something that Mr. Kemp said. You have an owner's manual that says nothing about instructions on oxidation says nothing about warnings. You have a tip card that says 48 hours, but he's recommending four different options. And he admits that they're all inconsistent. And there's been no expert on the side of the defense that has testified that any one of those approaches actually works. Not one. So how could they ever have a valid warning, a valid instruction, or determine that their meter and that probe was actually fit for the purpose of testing or providing more measurements for alkaline water. There's not a single person that's testified so. Go back to slide 51, quick second, Shane. This is 51. This is 50. 50. Five zero. So those are all the five, right there. Now, you recall in 2017, as I said before, they stopped using the MA025. You also recall, hopefully, that Mr. Brown recommended to Real Water two years later, in 2019, to use the MA025.
A9025. And Mr. Kemp played during his opening, I mean his closing, I'm sorry, and I won't repeat it, that he admitted that it was his mistake and he was incorrect for telling Real Water to use the MA9025 two years later, after it was discontinued. Also admitted there's nothing in the tip card after that that actually addresses how should we do it, other than these 48 hours, which we know doesn't work. And so I want you to go to uh, slide 58. And this will be Mr. Brown telling you that before the tip card came out, there were questions and inconsistencies. And after the tip card came out, there were still questions from customers on how to do it right. Go ahead, Shane. And so you added the tip card because you thought the customer needed information about storing it in vinegar for a minimum time, correct? Yeah, we had numerous phone calls and inquiries prior to adding the tip card. Uh, once the tip card was added, those uh, emails and phone calls were minimized. So the tip card has been beneficial. So you had a lot of people that were confused about what to do before you had the tip card, correct? I wouldn't say confused. But questions, yes. Okay, and after the tip card, you still have people that have questions, but not as many. Correct. Thank you. Now, finally, I want to get to what I consider to be one of the worst displays in dishonesty that I've seen uh, perhaps in trial. I want you to play slide 66. 40, I'm sorry, 46. <clears throat> Mr. Jason Brown's justification for his indirect lies, the selling point. Okay, top of the 1878. Quote, I have tons of Kingan water customers. Again, 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 selling point. We know you only have five or six. I'm just asking what he says, okay? Quote, I have tons of Kingan water customers. The go to or affordable is the MW500 point. That's right. That's what I said. I did it as a selling point. Now you okay. say that so it's you the best thing. A customer that you have tons of Canadian water customers, but you're telling me today that that's really not accurate. Again, it was a selling point statement. Okay. Well, there's 2,000 pounds in a ton. So how many can Again, you get? Because it's a selling point statement. That's all I'm going to say about it. Okay. But the go to or portable is the MW500 for King of Water customers. Well, the point statement. So that's not true? No. Well, let, me, let me try it again. It's a, it is a portable meter. That is a true statement. Do you know one of the. a selling point statement. Okay. Okay, forgetting sales buffer here. Do you know one way or the other whether the MW500 is a simple meter to measure negative ore for Kangan water customers? Yes, it is. All right, ladies and gentlemen. How many times did you hear him try to justify lying to customers by saying it was a selling point? Five, six? Now, I, I think you, you may not know this. Maybe you do. I went to military college. I went to the Citadel. And we have an honor code. The honor code is cadets, you know, just like you know, other military schools says. You don't lie, steal, or cheat, you know, tolerate those who do. And when I was at the Citadel, I did some research to figure out where that came from. And I found out that most of our military branches, Army, Navy, Marine, they have similar codes. You don't lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those who do. Mr. Brown lied repeatedly, in my opinion. He's misrepresented the, the capabilities of that meter, all under the guise of selling points. And on top of that, the president of Milwaukee, the only company who has yet to concede liability <coughs> and responsibility for these plaintiffs, their president condoned all of it, calling it indirect lies. You heard that. Let me show you slide 61. 
And I asked you about that, and I think when you left off, you said it was an indirect lie. Do you remember that? Remember using that word? Perhaps the jury remembers it. But do you remember? I don't remember saying it was an amended or right. Why? I don't. Would, I'm not sure what you mean when you ask that question, sir. Okay. Uh, Is I, 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 but I don't, wouldn't consider it lying to say to use sound points. I don't consider it to be a lie to use selling points. That's his position. Slide 62. I don't think Mr. Brown was dishonest. And let me ask you this. Since I can't get a yes or no to that question. When you came here on Tuesday and sat down, were you tired? Oh, I hadn't slept well the night before thinking about this process. Had you just gotten out of the hospital? Me? Yeah. No, sir. Were you prepared? I, I was reasonably prepared as best as I could. So if the answers you gave me on Tuesday were wrong and not honest, you got no excuse other than being a little tired, correct? Other than tired, uh, and uh, I, did you say you're dishonest? I said that you were dishonest. Like, using for an example, when you told us uh, that you actually tested these different recommendations on conditioning, conditioning the uh, probe, and then we pull out your deposition, and you said no tests were done. Were you unprepared when you came here on Tuesday? Did you just get out of the hospital? Were you confused? I mean, tell me what justification you have for not telling the truth on Tuesday. Okay, uh, uh, Henry Instruments, as I was talking to, did not do any testing, uh, but. No, I wasn't any of those. I'm sorry. Uh, which means you had no justification if you told that you misrepresented yourself, correct? Uh, correct? Uh, correct. Thank you. He had to admit that he'd lied two days before you. This was on Thursday. Two days before Tuesday, he lied in front of this jury. And I finally, through cross-examination, he had to admit it. But think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Any customer of Milwaukee, they don't have the depositions that I had. They didn't have the exhibits. They didn't have the testimony, the emails, everything that I needed in front of you with the authority of this court to make him finally tell the truth. That's what it took. It took all of those things for us to be able to finally get him to admit he lied to you on Tuesday. That's what it took. You can't tell me that that company doesn't need a wake-up call in the form of some form of exemplary or punitive damages. Because it's okay in their minds. The standard operating procedure for the number two person to use selling points as a cover to line, and unless he's caught red-handed, he was not going to tell the truth to you. And that's just, that's just the bare facts. Next slide. Now this is just a list of everything he, in my opinion, how he misrepresented himself. He said no one has ever returned an ORP meter asking for a refund. And then we find out they sent replacements, very similar to what Real Water did. Instead of sending him money, they sent another meter to him. Well, you know, that's sending some more hydrazine water. That's what Real Water did. And what the meter company did, Milwaukee did, that's sending them some more bad meters. That's their answer. Now, Jason testified that instead of refunding the money, they sent new programs. That's what they did. Next slide. Using your feeders for negative readings in the niche market. Jason said it was one third to one fourth of their market was alkaline water, not a niche market. Next one. Hannah does not pre oxidize the probe, pre -oxidize the probe with vinegar because it's a food item. Remember that? Regulated by the FDA, they would need a new license. What's the truth? So let's see what he said during his deposition, when he was also sworn under oath. He testified that they didn't pre-oxidize because of the extra step in labor. Again, they don't want to spend the money to do it right, and it didn't have a smell that was pleasant. Next one. 
<laughs> this, is, this one had me, I was laughing under my breath here. He testified that they had a 4.5 star rated meter. Three to five percent was industry standard for defective products. And Jason Brown said 10% of their products. More than three times what he says is the industry standard. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna stop here in terms of the slides. What I will what I will tell you. Wait a second, we have one more. I apologize. Real water did not indicate that it had difficulty getting consistent readings from meter. We got emails 2019 from Real Water to Milwaukee indicating this problem. Go right ahead, Shane. All right, and you've also become aware of the fact that there were customers of Milwaukee that sent emails and checks indicating that they were having difficulty getting consistent readings from your meter, correct? None of them were from real water. Now that's, a, again, a lot. We know, because it's been introduced in the evidence here, that real water sent February 2019 to Mr. Jason Brown of real water, I mean, sorry, of Milwaukee, the second guy in charge, an email asking about it. Next slide. Now this one was the one I always had that to as well, to be honest. He tells us that he, he testified that he used the meter to test his girlfriend's pool. It was a very long, drawn-out explanation of how he used it. And he tells us in deposition, under sworn circumstances, I have not used an ORC meter for a specific reason, for a specific application, for anyone in specific. I guess his wife is not anyone, his girlfriend is not anyone in specific. I have had an ORP in my hand, and I've seen a reading. That is it. He could not help himself mis with, with uh, misrepresentations. Finally, Shane. <clears throat> so when your deposition was taken, this very question was asked. You didn't point out this use of it in pool, did you? No, because it was my girlfriend's pool. It's not a company. It's not uh, going into a, a business application. It's not going in for a customer uh, trying to show or demonstrate it. it. It's it was for a pool, and it might have even been this summer, actually, uh, that I used it. So you said maybe this summer now? A little while ago, you told this during before that. That was uh, it, it was last year. Now you say it this time, summer. Time passes very rapidly, uh, and sometimes. You know, as you get older, yeah, and no, nothing locks in quite, quite perfectly. So I'm not lying, I'm not trying to lie. I'm just giving an example of a story that happened. Now, did it, uh, I, did I remember it exactly the summer? I, uh, but I remember, uh, I even have pictures somewhere, you know, they're sending me the, the full picture turned green because she was trying to do something that she should have and corrected it. So, Yes, sir. So your position now is we're all getting older. You confused last summer with this year. You confused not even using an, an orc meter with using an orc meter. That's what you're telling us. Uh, what I'm saying is sometimes you don't remember perfectly a date. That's all. That's his testimony. And so I want to end with end this part of my closing with showing you jury instruction number 15. Shane, can you put that on the screen, please? Here we go. Jury number, jury instruction number 15, which you will receive when you start your deliberations. The credibility or believability of a witness should be determined by his or her manner upon the stand, his or her relationship to the party, his or her fears, motives, interest or feelings, his or her opportunity to have, been, to have observed the matter to which or he, he or she testified, the reasonableness of his or her statements and the strength or weakness of his or her recollections. If you believe that a witness has lied about any material fact in the case, you may disregard the entire testimony of that witness or any portion of this testimony which is not proved by evidence. 
Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of Milwaukee, the final defendant who's not accepted responsibility or, or responsibility been imposed upon him, you heard what he had to say. You heard the misrepresentations. I would venture to say there's no reason to believe a single thing that came out of his mouth, given the facts in this case. And as a result, I believe that not only should damages be awarded to each of these plaintiffs, but punitive damages should be also assessed against Anna and Milwaukee, in addition to real one for its own conduct. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. Can we approach? And actually, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I thought that we needed to need a quick break and not the restroom. And that's what we're going to do. And it's not like a, we want to move on, but I want to make sure that all calls of nature are addressed. <laughs> so anyway, remember you're admonished not to converse amongst yourselves or with anyone else on any subject uh, connected with this trial or to read, watch, or listen to any report or, or comment on the trial. <laughs> Or by any medium of information, including us on location, newspaper, television, radio, social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Thunder, Snapchat, or the form of expressing your opinions on the subject. All right, so the part is your Curious there. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Are we prepared an exhibit list of just the admitted exhibit to um, so the the proposed exhibit list doesn't go back with the jury? I provided copies to supposing counsel earlier. It seems that we are all in agreement on this. If I can approach and bring it to you, but absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, we'll be in the precincts. Thank you. All right. All right, so jury. Please be seated. Thank you. All right, did the party stipulate to the presence of the jury? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, my first question is if the sound is good, so we won't have to get changed on microphones. You should be coming, Mr. You should be. I'm good? I'm talking loud? <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank you on behalf of Real Water, on behalf of myself, on behalf of Mr. Kaufman. Uh, we, uh, I want to start where we, uh, where we began. Um, when we first met some of you as a potential juror panel in this case, uh, we had an opportunity to talk to you, we had an opportunity to ask you questions. And one of the jurors, uh, I don't remember which one I wish I did, I don't know if they made it on the panel or not, they asked an excellent question. Uh, we had said that this case is about reasonable damages, and one of the jurors had said, well, how do we determine compensatory damages? And I thought that was an excellent question, and for various reasons, uh, now is the time where we we'll finally get to explain it to you, and the plaintiffs have started to explain it to you and giving you their position, and I'm going to talk about uh, reasonable compensatory damages. Uh, where I want to start, though, is, uh, again, what I've said many times throughout the course of this trial. There should not have been one drop of hydrazine in real water. That is undisputed. Our product should, have not, should never have made these people sick. And it did make these people sick. And that is undisputed. I want to talk a little bit, just really, really short, about how this process of closing arguments work. Uh, you've heard from the plaintiffs, now you're hearing from real water. 
then you hear from the meter defendants, and then because the plaintiffs have the burden of proof, they get to have the last word in this case. And so uh, presumably somebody for uh, the plaintiffs will talk, whether it's both Mr. Kemp and Mr. Pepperman, or Mr. Kemp or Mr. Pepperman, and Mr. Parker will have an opportunity to respond to the things that I say, the things that uh, the meter defendants say. Uh, and then that's the end of it. And then, you know, I guess, uh, blessedly, you get to finally uh, go deliberate and reach a decision in this case. So we're very, very close to the end. Uh, I just don't want, and we just don't want you to be under a misunderstanding that something is said, perhaps after we get done with our presentation, that we don't respond to, that we somehow agree to it. Um, as we said during opening, uh, people tend to want to put words in our mouth, and uh, we can speak for ourselves just fine. And the words that we have for you is, we're responsible. There is, there is no doubt about that. So what I want to do is I want to walk through a couple of the jury instructions. Uh, Mark, if you go to the very first one. This is jury instruction number seven. It always seems odd that attorneys want to argue or uh, advise the jury to use common sense. But fortunately, Nevada law allows the jury to use common sense. You'll have these. Uh, they don't look like this. I put them on this form just because it's easier to, to read and, and quicker. Um, you'll, have, you'll have these as part of your deliberation process. You can look at all the jury instructions and you'll be able to render a verdict. So this is, the, this is number seven, common sense. You use your, your own experience, your life experiences. And what we're asking you to do for the water is in reaching a verdict on damages. You'll be able to talk amongst each other and deliberate and come up with a number. And Mr. Kemp and Mr. Parker have suggested some numbers I'll talk about those in a little bit. We could go to the next one. This is another jury instruction, or this is still part of the same instruction, jury instruction number seven. The verdict can never be influenced by sympathy, prejudice, or public opinion. I'm not going to read these slides. For anybody in the military, I know that's a, that's a no-no. They do PowerPoints, and then they read the slides, and people are like, oh, please. I'm not going to do that to you. Um, sympathy, we can be empathetic. We can understand that real water made these people sick and that shouldn't have happened, and that's okay. But we can't let that interfere with a reasonable verdict arrived at in this case. And that's all we're asking you to do. Uh, if we go to the next one, this is jury instruction 38. What's important about this instruction is that you'll be rendering a verdict for each plaintiff. And in real water's case, you're going to be finding damages for each plaintiff. That is not disputed by real water. You're going to put a dollar amount for each one of these plaintiffs, and that is not disputed. Okay. So what's important, though, and what we want you to take away from this jury instruction, we've heard argument about who was sicker, who went through what, whatever's worse. And remember, Blaine Jones said, I wouldn't worse, wish this on my worst enemy. Okay. Look at each person individually and award money damages to each person individually. And that's, that's really what the point of this instruction is, and that's why we wanted to go over it with you. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this is part of jury instruction 38, I believe. And this really goes to the dollar amount that you're going to be filling in that real water is responsible for. The physical and mental pain, there is no doubt not at all that these plaintiffs have experienced physical and mental pain. That is not disputed. <clears throat> we want you to, the hard part is that you've got to come up with a dollar amount for these. They suffered, uh, suffered. They had anguish. There's no doubt about those things either. Okay? Each plaintiff incurred those things, and you've got to award a dollar amount to each plaintiff. And that is not disputed by, by real water. Real water caused their injuries and is responsible for their injuries. And you as the jury will put a dollar amount to that. Let's go to the next one. This is the part of jury instruction 38. The court has already determined the past and future medical costs of these plaintiffs. Now you may recall that Dr. Hudson, I had I think two or three questions only for Dr. Hudson. Dr. Hudson testified that uh, acute liver injury or acute liver failure 
is a serious illness. There is no doubt at all that these plaintiffs have a serious liver illness. There is no doubt at all that one of the plaintiffs died, and we'll get there in a minute. We also have no doubt that these plaintiffs should be awarded, and they will be awarded, not by the jury, but by the court, their future medical expenses. And I'm going to talk about those when we get there, because I want you to know what those are, what those have been taken care of. So they're going to get their past medical expenses. They're going to get their future medical expenses. So you don't have to worry about those things in your award. You're just focused on pain and suffering and disfigurement and some of the other damages that we'll talk about for each and every plaintiff. Let's go to the next slide. All right, this is the hard one. This is where it's really important for the jury to come up with a number. And this is what this is the, the most difficult task that the parties to this case have given you, which is coming up with a number. There's no definite method of calculation for the number that you've got to come up with. Okay. Reasonable compensation for pain and suffering. You don't have to use an opinion of any expert. And you certainly do not have to listen to what I'm going to say or what they've said. The arguments of counsel are not evidence as to the pain and suffering of this jury. What we do in closing arguments is to call your attention to some of the evidence that you've heard and just use that opportunity to remind you. But ultimately, the decision is yours. Okay, in making that decision, and these are the words that we used in uh, voir dire with a lot of you, you exercise that it should be just and reasonable in light of the evidence. And you exercise calm and reasonable judgment in coming up with that number. Now, the plaintiffs have played for you uh, the uh, deposition of Blaine Jones. And you recall that. You recall they had hidden his face. They had had this testimony of what this person had gone through, how they had gone to the hospital, how they had checked themselves into a hotel, how they wouldn't worship us on their, their worst enemy, how you couldn't pay them $10 million to go through this again. We would submit to you that's an emotional response from Mr. Jones, a perfectly understandable one. But that's not calm and reasonable judgment like the jury should, should exercise. That's Mr. Jones exercising a pretty justifiable emotional response. And, 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 you're, and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's fine that you know that. Consider it. But consider some of the other things that we're going to talk about. All right. Uh, next instruction. There's no definite standard. Calm and reasonable judgment. That's it. Okay. We're going to get to the hard ones in a minute. So let's, let's do that. Let's get to the very first hard one. Let's go to the next slide. All right. This is the Gallagher family. This is a difficult one for you. <coughs> Past medical expenses that are going to be awarded by the court for Ryan Gallagher are about $200,000. The future medical expenses that are going to be awarded by the court are about $50,000 for Ryan Gallagher. You, the jury, will decide the past and future physical and mental pain, suffering, anguish, and disability, and permanent injury of Orion Gallagher. We're not providing you with a suggested number for Orion Gallagher. That is up for you to decide. <coughs> the plaintiffs provided a, a number. The meter defendants may provide a number. But we are going to leave this to your calm and reasonable <coughs> judgment. The next one, Camille Gallagher. You saw her testify. You saw her testify uh, the pain and the anguish that she went through. You also saw her testify that Orion's doing well now, that he's four years old. You're going to use those bits of evidence in your common sense to award her damages. The same with Brian Gallagher, Orion's father. Again, common reasonable judgment. You've heard what the plaintiffs have suggested as a number. The meter defendants may or may not suggest a number. But ultimately, that number is for you, the jury, to decide. These are questions 6, 7, and 8 on the verdict form. Okay. Now, let's go to uh, the next slide, Mr. Haley. Again, Mr. Haley 
has about $37,000 in past medical bills that Real Water is responsible for. There is no doubt about that. It is about $50,000 in future medical monitoring costs that Real Water is responsible for. Now, again, remember what Dr. Hudson said. You can have, liver injury is a serious injury. Dr. Hudson has recommended all of the plaintiffs, um, we'll talk about Ms. Ms. Ryerson said, all of the plaintiffs should have future medical monitoring. And Real Water agrees with that. And Real Water agrees with the amount of that. And the court's going to award that $50,000. All right, let's go on to the next one, Mr. Botiz. Okay, Mr. Botiz is gonna be awarded by this court his past medical specials, the, the dollar amounts he spent for the hospital, about $58,000. He's also going to be awarded by this court $50,000 in future medical monitoring. Now, you have heard Mr. Botis tell about his injuries. You've heard of his dislike for the hospital. Perfectly understandable. Whether or not he chooses to do the medical monitoring in the future, we're not going to argue that. We're sick. Real Water says give him the, the medical monitoring cost. He's the injured party. He'll decide what he's going to do with it. Okay. Finally, we believe for Mr. Botis, he had stomach issues before ever drinking real water. He currently has stomach issues. There, there's no doubt about that, but there's also no doubt that real water made him sick. We think a compensatory award for his physical and mental pain, his suffering, his anguish, his disability, $500,000 is a reasonable number. That's argument of the attorney. Again, you will, you will all pick your own number. You don't have to take Mr. Kemp's number. You don't have to take my number. You provide the number. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, Mr. Belsky. Mr. Belsky has $36,000 in past medical specials that the court is going to award him. Real Water concedes that. He has future medical monitoring of $50,000. You've heard Mr. Belsky testify about his injury. You've heard him testify how he was sick, how he got sick on uh, like a Wednesday or a Thursday, or actually earlier than that, he was watching the Knights play. How he was sick all weekend, how he started to get better as the weekend ended, how he has mental anguish in the future, just like Mr. Bautista's, and I don't mean to minimize any plaintiff's injury. He's worried about the future, and that's why there's medical monitoring costs. And that's why we think that uh, award uh, for his pain, his suffering, his anguish, his disability of any of $500,000 for Mr. Belsky is a reasonable one. But you, the jury, will decide what that number is. Uh, it's about you know, roughly 10 times the medical monitoring costs. Does that matter? No, it doesn't matter. It's just a number. All right, let's go to the next one. Ms. Arnone. Ms. Arnone testified right here in front of you that she was transported to UCLA. She went through a terrible experience. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Her past medical bills were $339,000 and change. There is no doubt that Real Water is responsible for that. For her future medical monitoring, they believe $20,000, we agree. She was transported to UCLA. She was sick in California. There is no evidence that disputes that. She stayed with family in California. We think that a million dollar award by you is a reasonable number for her uh, past and future physical and mental pain, her suffering, her anguish, her disability, her permanent injuries. We believe a million dollars is a reasonable award for that, but again, that's just a number we're suggesting. The jury is going to make its own decision. All right, let's go to uh, Mr. Hugh. Mr. Hugh, there is no doubt that Mr. Hugh had the most significant injury. Uh, I think the plaintiffs have argued that, but, I, but again, I don't want to contradict myself. I think every plaintiff was injured seriously. And I think every plaintiff deserves compensation. And, and, and that's not disputed. The concern for Mr. Hugh <clears throat> is the future because of the scarring to his liver. And the $50,000 for the future medical, again, whether he chooses to use that or not, 
that is his decision. We shouldn't have put him in a position to have to make that decision. We can see that. And we think $750,000 for his pain and suffering is reasonable. You, the jury, will decide what the reasonable number is. We're just trying to give you a yardstick and answer that question that was answered in the in, in word dear, which is how in the world do you, I'm using my language, how in the world do you calculate that number? The actual question is, how do you calculate that number? All right, let's talk about Ms. Ryerson and her family. It's terrible, okay? Real water caused her death. There, again, no dispute. Not only are you going to be awarded damages for her death, you're going to be awarded damages for her sisters, Judy Ryerson, Patricia Sullivan, and Richard Ryerson. Richard Ryerson, you've heard the plaintiff say he couldn't be here. He still is entitled to an award. In determining the amount of loss suffered by the heirs, and they are the heirs to Kathy Ryerson, you'll decide upon the sum of money sufficient to, confer, to and fairly compensate each heir for the items listed in the next two instructions. Okay, you'll have these instructions. This is instruction number 40. Let's go to the next page. This is instruction number 41, all right? These are the categories that you can use to determine the amount of damages for the Ryersons. And again, I'm not gonna read these. I'm gonna allow you to read these. I, I, it's important though for you to consider the court's instructions when you come about a verdict for the Ryerson family. Let's go to the next one, which is really hard. Grief or sorrow. Again, this is not disputed. You heard the Ryersons testify. You heard uh, Ms. Sutherland testify. Any grief or sorrow suffered by the heirs or reasonably certain to be experienced in the future is part of the calculation that's got to go into your verdict. All right, let's go to the next slide. These are the numbers that we want to call your attention to. <coughs> Kathy Ryerson's past medical costs, I said it before and I rounded it up, it was about $700,000. The exact number, I guess, is $681,230, and that will be awarded by the court. Of course, she passed away, there is no future medical monitoring. For each of the three heirs, we suggest $500,000 for each of them. <clears throat> Will it bring the Kathy back now? It won't. Okay. It, it's, it's a number. And unfortunately, that's what the law provides, is you, the jury, have to fill in a number. All right. So a million dollars for the estate, for the disfigurement and pain and suffering of Kathy Ryerson, that's the estate. And that's question number 14. And then 15, 16, and 17, $500,000 for, for each heir. And we think that's, that's reasonable. Before we go to the next slide, I, I wanna kind of put all this in context for you. These are the damages that Real Water has admitted. Okay, they're responsible for these. The ultimate, the, the medical costs will be determined by the court. The medical monitoring has been agreed to and will be added to the verdict. We've tried to give the jury some numbers to use to help complete the verdict form. Ultimately, it's up to the jury to, to complete those numbers. Okay, the last point that we wish to make is on the punitive damages. There's been a lot of talk about the punitive damages, and we want to talk about that. So let's go to the first slide. We're going to ask you to check the box no on punitive damages. And we're going to tell you why we believe you should check the box no. Let's go to the first instruction. This is jury instruction number 47. Okay. Real water is admitted liability. The determination for the jury is exemplary and punitive damages. Those, those terms have been used interchangeably by the attorneys. Um, it's the same thing. They're to punish. And the standard to be applied is clear and convincing evidence. And we'll get to that. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is jury instruction number 47 continued. 
oppression, despicable conduct that subjects a person to cruel and unjust hardship with conscious disregard to the right of a person. Uh, fraud doesn't apply. We, we argue fraud doesn't apply to real water. Uh, implied malice is something that has been argued for real water. Again, despicable conduct engaged with a conscious disregard for the rights or safety of others. And we'll, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, finally, let's go to, well, let's go through each of these. Now, we talk about conscious disregard. Again, that's part of jury instruction 47. Let's go to the next one. All right. This is, this is the last part of 47. This is where the jury is going to decide if real water and the other defendants as well engaged in this conduct, it justifies an award of punitive damages. All right, let's go to the next slide. In arriving at this decision, the standard of proof is not preponderance of the evidence, but is clear and convincing evidence, okay? The court is giving you the law of what that means, clear and convincing evidence. So let's talk about what that evidence is going to be. All right, let's talk. Let's go to the next slide. You've heard argument that real water didn't test the water. What plaintiffs meant to say was real water didn't test the water for hydrazine. That's undisputed. There shouldn't have been a drop of hydrazine in the water. We've introduced evidence. We've introduced lab reports. But none of these lab reports tested for, for hydrazine. They didn't know what hydrazine was, okay? Exhibit 2093, 2302, 2352, 2343. These are big, long laboratory reports. And Blaine Jones testified that they tested the water weekly, quarterly, yearly, and a comprehensive test every four years. The problem with their tests is they've never heard of hydrazine. These tests don't test for hydrazine. So to say real water didn't do tests is an overstatement. Real water didn't do tests for hydrazine, and that's their fault. And that's why you should find them liable. All right, let's go to the next slide. Another thing that has come out, that real water failed an audit. Okay, Blaine Jones testified that, yeah, he recalls they failed an audit and there was a re-audit. Okay. They failed an audit in 2019 as part of their program of cost to <coughs> retail water. They didn't pass. Let's go to the next slide. Again, there's no dispute. They failed the audit. They didn't pass. Blaine couldn't recall the specific points where they couldn't pass. Blaine believed that um, one of the items was they didn't have a HACCP trained employee, and that was because that employee left. Blaine got the HACCP training, but he wasn't the one who replaced the person who left. It was actually Mr. Pham. And if we go to, um, let's, let's skip ahead to, instead of, let's go from part three to the next one. Let's skip that one because I just said it. This is the re-audit, okay? They failed the audit. Uh, for the 2018, they had to re audit. It was on there someplace, maybe it got cut off. Thank you. Somebody's got better eyes than me. <coughs> so they did a re audit, and what did they do? This was presented to you. Let's go to the next page. All of the things that they, fa they failed, now they passed. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter because it wouldn't have detected hydrazine. It doesn't detect hydrazine. Hydrazine was in the water. Is this an excuse for hydrazine being in the water? No, it's not. But it's information the jury should have. Is this an excuse for the plaintiffs becoming sick? No, it's not. But it's information for you to have. All right, let's go to the next one. A lot of testimony, a lot of argument about when hydrazine was found. The recall for the real water products happened in March of 2021. The water was tested by the FDA in October of 2021. The retail water was even tested later. Eurofin's laboratory was the laboratory that did the testing. 
this is the testimony that we played for you. I know our case has been brief. We wanted to make sure that you've got this point. Hydrazine is not something normally tested for. This is just not something water companies do. Again, does that excuse real water? No, not at all. It shouldn't have been in there. But it does go to whether or not you should check the box for punitive damages. We know they were testing the water. They just weren't testing it for hydrazine. All right. Do we have that um, clip that we could play, Mark? I know I'm skipping ahead. I, I like to be brief. Okay, Mr. Jones, going back on the record, um, I wanted to take you back to the time period around the recall, March of 2021. And I think earlier, you're, you're in Panama, is that right? Correct. And I think you said you were blindsided by this news. Correct. Did you have an understanding about what the potential problem was that arose in Las Vegas? At this time, I don't know if, if I knew at that point. Obviously, hindsight now is it's developed. Uh, we, we didn't know, I remember at the beginning, didn't know what the issue was whatsoever. The FDA came into uh, the Las Vegas facility initially, and they didn't really roll down the mace, I think, for a week or two. So it was focused on the home office delivery, because we did not sell any ready-to-drink out of that facility. It, it was all sold by distributors, such as UNFI or KE or Nevada Beverage. So at the point that this happened, it was believed it was only associated with the home and office delivery. And I guess subsequently people have claimed that they're ready to drink, but at the time we didn't have any thoughts that it was any, any association. All right. Did you do any investigation into what went wrong when people got... First of all, let me do this. Are you aware of an association between consuming real water five-gallon jugs in the fall of 2020 and liver injuries? I'll just, so we can cut to the chase, I think, I'll answer, I think, what you're asking me. Um, and if it isn't, you can give me a clarify. We had no idea that our, or I had no idea that our water was causing problems. My own son, Blaine, got very sick, and at the same time, we didn't stop drinking raw water. We didn't have any idea that it was associated with raw water whatsoever. I mean, he got sick himself. And if we would have thought it was real water, we would have done something. At that time, we did it because we didn't know there was any association whatsoever with real water. So no, I did not think that there was any problem with real water in October or November of 2020. I was completely blindsided when it happened in March. You don't have your data? No. Okay. Are you aware that hydrogen can be used as a type of rocket fuel? I'm not aware of the use for hydrazine. Are you aware that hydrazine can cause nervous system effects as well as liver and kidney damage? I'm not aware of the effects of hydrazine on the body, no. All right. Would you agree with me that hydrazine or potential rocket fuel should not be in a real water product? Yes, I would agree that it should not be in a real water product. There is no doubt that hydrazine should not have been in the real water product. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, again, thank you. Uh, on behalf of Real Water, we thank you for your time. Some of the other attorneys now get an opportunity to present to you. Uh, we do not get another opportunity to talk to you at this time, but we really appreciate that you've taken the opportunity to listen to us, that you've taken time out of your lives, and we uh, trust that we're under a just and fair verdict. Thank you.